this act, this this particular act is actually going through multiple iterations over the past and actually replaced the information technology act of the year 2000 the it act of the year 2000 was appropriate for that particular point in time but i think since then we've actually seen the rise data has actually become extremely data has become far more regnant in all our lives on a day to day basis as well as 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 well as the inability for the courts to end up actually legislating or sorry ruling on some of these matters also has become an active hindrance to the rights of private citizens as well as private individuals and entities with regard to their data protection and the and the privacy of their personal data as well so similar to the similar acts have actually been passed across the world when it comes to gdpr and everything else that's actually happened in Europe, in the US also is coming out with something, Australia, Japan, et cetera, as well. So I think this is India, this has actually been a landmark moment for India as of now. There are going to be a number of consequences and knockdown effects, not just on the private equity and venture capital industry, in terms of asset allocation, in terms of stock selection, as well as the as well as the formation of new investment theses, but also when it comes to portfolio companies as well, especially when it comes to ingesting data, digesting it, processing it, and actually pushing it forward. There are numerous interplays that this particular act has as of now with regard to the algorithms that end up actually underpinning a large amount of the transactions and interactions during our day-to-day -day lives itself. The right, the right to erasure, the right to actually change this particular data and the powers afforded to the data principle as of now are actually become very, very important. And along with this, the long-standing debate with regard to data localization, which is supposed to be all the data supposed to be localized in India to data can now be hosted in various other countries that the government will actually notify on that matter, does actually play a significant lever in terms in, in terms of how in terms of how data is actually collected, data is actually managed, as well as where investments can actually go into for data centers as well. We have seen the rise of data centers in India as of now become a very attractive attractive asset or opportunity as well. And several large giants across the entire world have actually partnered with uh, with uh, with Indian firms to end up actually creating this kind of localization as we speak. And I think what's especially important is the fact that there, there has been a significant uh, significant cleave that's actually been formed in terms of the data that relates to children or those individuals below the age of eighteen, as well as those individuals above the above the age of eighteen as well. There's already been there's already been afforded some degree of affordance to a number of to a, to a number of state actors as well and this is something when the when the regulations and the rules actually do come out i'm fairly certain will actually become an active form of debate for that matter to where the state can actually end up extending in some of these areas versus where versus where the private rights end up actually closing out as part of that itself so i think with regard to this there are numerous and there are op, there are information here that fund managers their cfos and their compliance teams as well uh, i think Shira, you may need to mute yourself uh, as of now perfect thank you so I think there is there is also from an operational standpoint from the funds as well significant amount of changes that all of us need to make to our uh, to our internal processes also the ability the uh, the need for us to end up actually maintaining data as per regulations given by SEBI, IFSA, various other authorities in India as well as well as the ability of data principles to end up actually seeking changes to them also an important part to note that it's not just online data that ends up getting collected but any offline data that ends up getting digitized as well does under, come under the ambit of this act also i think with the rise of digital india there is an increased emphasis for the need to reduce the amount of paper that's actually there and laws such as this will end up actually affecting operations for everyone also so i think this is something that needs to be analyzed in uh, analyzed in the fullness of time there are still rules and regulations that get to be released there are constitutions of the boards parts of the boards and all this has to be vetted through the court process as well for that matter similar to how when gst actually came about it fundamentally altered the way that business was actually conducted. I do personally believe that this particular act will also end up changing the way we end up actually operating and managing all of our functions. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to the Deloitte team as well for their presentation on this matter. And then we've actually curated this conversation in such a way that investors can speak about their perspective on some of these topics as well. And we'll actually go on to portfolio companies and they'll also speak about and analyze how this ends up actually affecting their day-to-day -day operations also in that regard. It's going to be a very fruitful conversation. We'd love to have a number of our people end up engaging with the experts who are here as well and voice any concerns, any clarity, any clarifications they may actually end up requiring also. The IBCA policy team is also at hand to make a note of everything that's here. And in case anything needs to be actioned out or clarity needs to be sought, vis-a-vis -vis the private equity and venture capital industry, we'll be more than happy to end up undertaking that as well. So with that, I'll actually hand it over to the Deloitte team. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Uh, I'll just request my co-panelists, actually, if they can rename, actually, a few, few people joined from my link. So it'll be great if you can rename. Otherwise, it shows multiple Srirams. Uh, and so over, so now we have a gist of and background about the act. 
but to uh, dwell and sort of give a formal uh, landscape. So I'd like to invite Goldie from Deloitte uh, to give a brief presentation on the act and then we move on to the panel. Over to you, Goldie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, my, I can't put my video on, so maybe that's okay. I'll try and present, uh, 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 I'll try and present uh, my slides, if that's, if that's fine. Allow me a minute. Uh, I am the the screen sharing is disabled. Shriram, can you give me the access? I'll present my screen. Uh, yeah, I'm, sure. part of, I'm part of I'll, Goldie's team. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Uh, yeah. Dhruva, you should be able to present now. Yes, I have the access. Just a second. So I think uh, when Dhruva is putting this on, right. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I, I must, uh, I must compliment Siddharth for that, uh, uh, for that uh, brief introduction. In fact, he's made my life simpler by, you know, sort of talking about most of the aspects. But just taking it, uh, sort of drilling it down one level below, right? Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is the journey of the of the uh, DPDP Act. Uh, you know how how it started and where we have sort of reached. While we will not talk about most of it, but I think two important things. One, I think the uh, the year twenty seventeen is the critical one because that's when uh, the Puttaswamy judgment came in. Uh, stating that uh, privacy was a fundamental right, also meaning that uh, a law had to be put into place under Article 21 of the Constitution. And that's the reason you see uh, uh, the DPTP Act today. Uh, the difference between the Act today and what we have seen in the past, you know, in 2019, and then a couple of other variations of the bill, is the fact that, you know, at that point in time, it was a much more detailed document. Uh, today it's a much simpler piece of legislation, but obviously, uh, you know, as as is the case, the devil will lie in the detail. That is the rules when they are sort of issued. At least uh, what we understand from public domain is that the rules are likely to be issued for a consultation by end of October, and uh, even the data protection board is likely to be constituted by end of October. Uh, give giving a, a month or two here and there. That's when we are, we should be having. A much, little more clarity on the amount of, uh, you know, obligations that data fiduciaries will need to comply with uh, going forward. Uh, but uh, but as of today, the law is applicable effective 12th of August 2023 when it was gazetted. Uh, one question which is which is asked uh, time and again is that uh, you know is this is this implemented right? And, uh, you know, how I like to answer that question is by saying that, you know, the the, the act is applicable, but uh, uh, the rules are yet to be issued. And the rules will actually state which provisions of the act get implemented uh, when. Most likely the, the important provisions, which are Article 8, 1, 8, 5, and, uh, you know, in respect of Articles 4, 5, 6, 7, which are notice, consent, specified purpose, and all of those things, Will is likely to get implemented much sooner in the sense in the next three to six months. And provisions with respect to uh, penal consequences or data protection board and everything else is likely to take some more time because, uh, you know, uh, it is yet to be set up. Uh, having said this, I think organizations should start thinking about it of how they will comply with the, with, with the data protection uh, law. Uh, as Siddharth rightly mentioned, this is similar to uh, GST. It's a fundamental change which will uh, which will need to be seen by every organization in this country. Uh, and when I say every means every because this even applies to employee data. So, so everybody in the country will be impacted by this regulation in some form or shape. With that, we can move to the next slide and feel free to ask questions if uh, uh, if some, somebody has a question, feel free to do so. Uh, this slide talks about the definitions 
uh, uh, I won't talk about each one of them, but some very critical ones. You know, data principle, simple one, every individual whose data is being uh, processed, collected, stored, is that, is that, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is that, uh, so every individual whose data is being collected, stored, processed is, is a data principle. Uh, data fiduciary uh, is, is any entity which by itself or jointly determines the purpose and the means of processing of personal data. In the context of the, of the act, there can be more than one data fiduciary for one piece of uh, personal data. And that is that is important to understand. Mm -hmm. With that, the, the related definition is of a data processor. Mm -hmm. And a data processor mm -hmm. is any entity who is processing the data at the behest mm -hmm. of a data fiduciary. And why this is important to understand and appreciate is because under the Act, uh, the obligations rest on the data fiduciary, meaning mm -hmm. that in an untoward incident of a of a breach. Uh, the penal consequences will apply on a data fiduciary even when the breach has happened at the, the at the end of a data processor. So the government has made it very clear that they are only going to hold the data fiduciary responsible mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the back-to-back -back contract has to be undertaken between the data fiduciary and the data uh, processor. So again, this is this is significant. This is this is a departure from how this happens in uh, EU GDPR. So this is a point of difference. Uh, the other two uh, important definitions on the on the slide are processing and specified purpose. Uh, processing is a very wide term, which basically means simply said that for anything where you touch the data, it is seen as as processing, it could mean collection, share, sharing, organizing, anything which you do. This even even de uh, deletion or erasure, that means you are processing the data. So it's a very very wide term. Uh, specified purpose is a new new concept brought into the uh, Act into the 2023 Act version. What it's what it means is that when when an uh, organization is issuing a notice for collecting data, for processing the same, the, the organization has to define the purpose for which the data is being collected. Uh, and that is what specified purpose means. So, uh, so gone are the days when an organization can seek an open-ended uh, consent uh, from a data principle. You will have, every organization will need to define uh, every specified purpose for which the data is being collected and where data will be used. Also means that if you have defined and if you have stated a purpose like A, B, and C, tomorrow if you want to use the data for a purpose B, then at that point in time, you will need to again go back to the data principle and seek a specified consent, a, a consent for another specified purpose so that you have the flexibility of processing data for that specified purpose. This is this is quite significant and uh, every organization will need to now rethink of uh, all the purposes for which they collect, store and delete data. Consent manager, uh, again, a new construct was there earlier also, but it's a, it's a construct which is not available in other pieces of, uh, 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 you know, uh, legislations across the world, but India has brought this concept. It's simply said, a consent manager is an entity which will collect, uh, store, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, provide the data to uh, the data fiduciaries on behalf of the data principle. So it's a go-between, if I may use that word, uh, 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 acting as an intermediary between the data principle and the data fiduciary. Group, next slide, please. So some key stakeholders, I've already spoken about most of them. Uh, we spoke about data principles, but this gives you a sort of a, a bird's eye view of how the data will also move. So data principle will share the data to a consent manager, can also share the data to a data fiduciary directly. But if it shares to a consent manager, then the consent manager will share it with the data fiduciary. 
the data fiduciary will share it with the data processor for processing the data, which will come back to the data fiduciary. Uh, for certain classes of data fiduciary, you also need to appoint a data protection officer. I'll talk about it uh, uh, in a couple of slides from now. Uh, and obviously, there's a data protection board, uh, which will be set up, which will be responsible for, uh, for ensuring compliance with the with the act, ensuring that, you know, if there are any breaches, any penal consequence to be applied. And at the end, there's a TDSAT where any appeal against the order of the uh, data protection board will lie. Beyond the TDSAT, uh, the appeal will lie to the Supreme Court. So that's the, that are the important key stakeholders within the frame of the act. Uh, Dhruv, next slide, please. So this is the, this is, this is how the, the act applies, right? Simply said, uh, wherever an Indian organization is collecting, storing or processing data of individuals in India, this date, this act applies. But this act also has two other limbs which are important to understand. Uh, it also has an extraterritorial uh, you know, jurisdiction. And what the law says is that foreign entities processing uh, uh, you know, data uh, in connection with uh, 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 offering goods or services to individuals in India. Uh, this this law will apply. The, the important word is offering here, right? And this is in distinction to what was stated in the 2019 bill, where the word used was sale. So offering is a much wider term. Hopefully, when the rules come in, uh, there will be some threshold which will be in, which will be sort of set out beyond which uh, you know foreign entities will need to comply with the DPDP provisions. Otherwise, this can become quite an onerous uh, obligation. And, uh, and uh, you know, one other question which, uh, which is sort of, you know, uh, which sort of flows from this is that how will, how will the Indian government ensure compliance by a foreign entity, uh, you know, of, of DPDP? So, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the act, the government has actually also introduced a provision wherein they have the right to take down content. And that is the provision which can be used where the government can uh, uh, request, uh, you know, using METI to uh, to try and uh, block some content where they are not complying with uh, the provisions of the Indian regulations. Also, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see uh, uh, the construct of a GCC, basically a captive center. So wherever an Indian company is processing data of foreign citizens, uh, uh, there is no there is no complete exemption for such kind of uh, uh, you know transactions uh, while most provisions of the of the bill will not apply but the most important provision which is which is uh, uh, you know section 8 1 and 8 5 uh, will apply which will which basically means that you know uh, organizations need to uh, need to ensure that uh, they have put in place the right uh, uh, you know technical organizational measures to ensure safeguard and security of the data which they are processing. So that is the most critical one. Uh, if there is any breach, then penal consequences can apply even though the data of foreign citizens is being processed by, by the data fiduciary in India. Uh, quickly, uh, no, this, just go back, Dhruv. Thank you. Uh, so two things. This, this act does not apply to personal data being processed by an individual for any personal or domestic purpose. So taking an example, if I maintain a record of people visiting my residence, then that, that will be out of the domain of this, uh, this uh, law. Uh, or if a personal data has been made available or made public by a data principal uh, of their own choice, then that is not governed by the, by the provisions of this act. Some of this, is, uh, some of this will get more clear as rules are issued because uh, 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 because some of this is gray right now. In what circumstances somebody will take a view that this data was made public by the data principal at on its own is uh, is a little gray right now. But hopefully we'll get more clarity as we go along. Yes, Dhruv, please move to the next slide. Uh, some key provisions. Uh, you know, one thing which is which is the bedrock of this law is the fact that data can be processed only when the consent has been granted by the data principal. That's that's a fundamental thing to be uh, appreciated. Or if consent is not uh, granted, then it can only be processed when there is a legitimate use. And legitimate use 
is uh, you know defined employment medical uh, employment purposes medical emergency uh, when there is a court order uh, security of the country so on and so forth so except that you have to seek consent in every case for processing data uh, uh, note uh, we spoke about this but i'll just you know talk about it uh, uh, a notice needs to be given by the organization uh, setting out the specified purpose and the and and uh, you know stating what the data will be used for uh, 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 also giving the the right to the uh, individual or the data principal to seek erasure of data uh, as in when they deem fit uh, we spoke about consent we spoke about specified purpose and and some of the obligations i think the most important obligation while you have to put in a grievance redressal mechanism. I is I think the most important one is the fact that you need to put in place technical and organizational measures. Uh, uh, you need to think through changing the security, the systems, the processes, the technology to try and comply with the act. I think that is the most fundamental uh, obligation of a data fiduciary. Next slide, please. Quickly, uh, you know, child data, why this is important is that uh, 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 there are multiple organizations which uh, collect uh, that data of uh, individuals who are below 18 years. This is again a departure from what is stated in the uh, uh, UGDPR where the age of a child is 13 to 16 years. Uh, in every in every case where a children data is being processed, you need a consent from a, a legal guardian. Uh, more importantly, no tracking and behavioral monitoring uh, can be undertaken of uh, of, of child data, or uh, uh, you know, you, the entity can't be undertaking anything which is detrimental to the well-being of the ch child. Very wide terms, uh, no no clarity on what uh, will be seen as detrimental to well-being. It's a, uh, hopefully some clarity will arise when rules are issued. Uh, uh, there are some exemptions possible. Uh, but again, it's not stated what kind of entities will get an exemption uh, from some, some of these provisions for processing children data. Moving on, Dhruv, please. We, I, I spoke about this, you know, a class of data, uh, data fiduciaries which will, get, which will get classified as a significant data fiduciary. Uh, so what the, what the act says is that depending on the volume and the sensitivity of the personal data which is being processed, or the or and or, or risk to the rights of the data principal, uh, sovereignty, electoral democracy, security, and etc. Uh, some some data fiduciaries may get classified as a significant data fiduciary, right? And if that happens, then there are three additional obligations on such significant data fiduciary. You will need to appoint an individual as a as a data uh, protection officer in India. Again, this is uh, this is in distinction to what happens in UGDPR, where you can have uh, both an organization as a DPO and also you can have one for the entire world. But here in India, you'll have to have to have an Indian Indian individual, uh, a resident individual uh, being a DPO in India. You have to undertake independent audits and also undertake uh, uh, you know an impact assessment of uh, of how you are complying with the provisions of the Act. So a lot of compliance burden, which has been brought in on any entity which is uh, seen as a significant data fiduciary. Moving on, uh, so again, uh, Siddharth spoke about this. Uh, so this is the cross-border data. Uh, what it means is that, you know, all kinds of data can be sent overseas for processing, except in two cases. One, where uh, 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 the country has been restricted by the Indian government for, for exporting data, uh, or where there is a higher degree of restrictions placed by a sectoral regulator. Uh, case in point being the Reserve Bank of India, which has placed restrictions of financial data under its 2018 April uh, notification, or, or uh, SEBI, or IRDI, uh, and, and some, some stuff in consumer protection. So if you use all of that, or if an entity is governed by any of those regulations, then you will need to comply with the higher set of uh, restrictions placed under those regulations, uh, you know, without which you are 
P2 transfer data overseas uh, to a country which is uh, which is not distributed by the government. I think this is my uh, uh, this is one last one slide before the last. Uh, this is this is this talks about the penal consequences, right? Uh, and if you see, uh, there are seven seven uh, uh, incidents on which data, uh, you know, uh, penal consequences can be applied. I think while this is quite clear, but I think the most important point I wanted to make on this slide is that for any one incident, it is possible that you are you are getting governed by two or more of the of of these clauses. Uh, okay. To give an example, uh, so let's assume that uh, you are processing children data, and you are uh, so you have failed uh, in your obligations to protect a child data, and also uh, uh, it can be demonstrated that uh, the, the you have not put into place the right systems uh, measures for, for for protecting data as a as a as a as a whole. Then in that case. Uh, technically speaking, at the maximum, the penalty could be 450 crores, which is the first and the third one on this, right? So, so companies and organizations need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, if any any incident arises which which results in two or more uh, of these situations arising, then the penal consequences can be clubbed and could be much higher than what is uh, you know applicable to an independent or an individual uh, case. The one thing which you see on in the bottom of the right hand side where it's in green is I spoke about this, but the government has also brought in the principles of takedown content, largely in two cases where where it's in public interest or where the penal or where monetary penalties have been imposed in two or more cases. So there the government has a right to uh, you know take down uh, any website or app or any content which is available. Look, next slide, please. So while I spoke about this as I was going along on the presentation, but uh, 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 from a completeness standpoint, these are some of the important distinctions between uh, GDPR and uh, DPDP. Uh, the first one being that, uh, you know, the GDPR talks about classes of data or categories of uh, personal data, which is not uh, there in DPDP, which it basically means that the government is saying that you know all categories of data need to uh, go through the same level of checks and balances, right? You have to uh, you have to see all data with the same lens. In my view, it's possible that when rules come out, the government may bring in certain additional safeguards to be brought in for sensitive data such as you know biometrics, financial, health, so on and so forth. But today, as we stand, uh, all data needs to be seen with the same lens. Uh, you spoke about the fact that uh, data processes obligations uh, do not exist under the Indian law uh, while they exist under GDPR. Breach notification period, uh, it's 72 hours under GDPR, but it's not specified in DPDP. Uh, could be as low as uh, six hours or could be as, as good as 72 hours. We'll have to see the, we'll have to wait for the rules to come in. Uh, hopefully it will be, uh, you know, in line with GDPR. Uh, DPO and DPIA, uh, as, as I stated earlier, it only applies to significant data fiduciaries in India, applies to all uh, fiduciaries or controllers as we call them in uh, GDPR. Uh, transfer of personal data we spoke about, child data we have done, uh, a penalty, when I say fixed amount is the highest amount, which is stated under the Indian law, but under the GDPR it's based on turnover, as was the case under the 2019 bill, uh, which was being proposed in India. The last one being the right to compensation. Uh, so under the GDPR, an individual, an impacted or an affected individual, which is the data principal, also has a right to seek uh, compensation from the data fiduciary, which is not there under the DPDP. Uh, one, one thought could be that whatever money is collected by the government uh, by imposing penal consequences, which goes into the Consolidated Fund of India, may be used by the government to uh, to uh, you know compensate the affected individuals we'll have to see how that happens but uh, could be a possibility so that's all from uh, that's all from my side happy to take any questions or we can do the questions at the end
thank you thank you goldie i think i uh, will do the questions at the end uh, so now i would like to hand over to neha to sort of start the investor uh, panel so to understand the perspective from investor lens then we'll move on to the founder perspective so over to you neha to introduce the panel and take it forward yeah sure thanks uh, thanks shri ram uh, i hope i'm audible yeah we can hear you okay great so uh, good afternoon everyone and you know uh, a wonderful opportunity to at least you know uh, uh, moderate the panel so a quick introduction about myself so i am neha agarwal i am a partner with deloitte and uh, work in the regulatory space and uh, you know i am happily joined by uh, three of my panelists i have ashish vipadia from bloom ventures i have shilpa from umidyar and uh, supratham from khetan so welcome everybody on board so very interesting uh, you know development which is happening in the in the data privacy space and especially you know uh, sidharth spoke about it goldie spoke about it but i think it is also important to assess that what does it mean for the investors and therefore you know uh, from a portfolio company perspective while there will be a lot of reengineering which needs to be done in terms of you know the processes which needs to be there in place but at the same time you know it is also bringing in lot of consciousness uh, as an investor because you are a stakeholder and you, there there's lot of participation there so probably i mean it, it does impact your brand it does have you know uh, uh, concerns with respect to you know the possible liabilities and issues that could arise and obviously there are opportunities which are specifically placed for startups so i mean it's definitely a, a, a an area to watch out for so in today's conversation i mean we will we'll touch upon some of these aspects in terms of you know how uh, we we have been seeing it from an investor lens perspective and also i mean you know what do we expect in terms of you know the new rules that will come in so any kind of clarifications that may be required so uh, ashish the first question to you that you know you have uh, so many companies uh, you know where bloom has invested and especially where they, it is an early stage investor as well so uh, how are you seeing that you know your portfolio companies gearing up to this any quick reactions that you would want to place to uh, the audience here sure thank you uh, thank you so neha i'll just uh, split this into two parts at an overall level in terms of how we are seeing this at the outset there is going to be a division between companies that are already at a certain scale and those that are not at a very high scale as it is always the case whenever there is regulation which is being introduced it there is going to be some degree of additional advantage that uh, an incumbent will have we have seen that with financial services every piece of regulation does tend to benefit a incumbent and startups are or a fintech is at a some bit of disadvantage similarly the startups that exist today have scaled up a little bit will definitely be at a little extra advantage over people who are going to start off today because of a variety of reasons that we discussed uh, earlier in goldie's panel as well so when you put that into perspective at an early stage you are going to be asking the companies to be a lot more conscious and alert because there will be that rush to get into a certain collection of data and utility of data but the second part of this is also that there are enough areas where the rules haven't been notified so how are you going to act on some of those things is uh, which definitely leads you to a overall observation that you will get the companies to understand some of these things a little better we also have this services team that people have access to so enough founders would uh, reach out to the lawyers and the counsels in those team to support them with an initial interpretation but there is going to be a lot of things that will emerge over the next uh, maybe couple of quarters there are previous legislations where there are boards which have been constituted or at least provided to be constituted which the government has not so until some of these things get into action the awareness the basic architecture of compliances and a lot more sensitivity to compromising of data architecture is what you will be forcing on like a year ago or two years ago you would see a headline in a digital portal of certain data leakage it is now much more consequential it had consequences even then but still a business potentially would be in a position to go down the path of an apology and get away with it to an extent not any more 
you don't know how it will be treated over the next uh, few quarters when there are a lot more guidelines. So it is an uncertainty that does exist. So the priorities on awareness and caution and err on the side of conservatism when you go down this path. And you will look at it whether it's very early or whether it's growth stage before firming up your policy. The integrities to this we can discuss later, but yeah, this is broadly the way this will play fan out. No, I think I mean the uh, uh, very interesting uh, feedback. Definitely, there are uh, there are, there are changes, and therefore, you know, everybody is really waiting for the rules to have you know at least the, the complete clarity on you know what they need to do. And uh, Shilpa, I'll move to you. Uh, that you know, uh, again, the very similar kind of a question, but again, I would want to hear it more from a perspective that are you looking at uh, you know a common framework because I mean a lot of companies will have you know uh, the companies are invested in various sectors, and similarly. Each of the portfolio company also has various stakeholders there. I mean, sure, from a from an investor perspective. So, do you think that there should be some sort of a standardization mechanism that should be built up in terms of you know the right processes and you know given your experience, what what is your perspective on that? Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Neha. Really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, before I get to the sectoral approach, you now uh, uh, let me just step back and 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 start a little bit with a cliche, which is that. We all used to say data is the new oil. Uh, and I, I think like any resource, you know, um, it goes through three phases when there's any resource that's newly found. There's a exploration phase where everybody looks at how you can use the resource in new ways. Then there's a innovation and maturation phase where new models emerge for using the resource. And, and then finally, you have a regulation phase when there are many players and, and effectively the sheriff comes to town, new rules are set. Uh, and how you use an important resource um, uh, kind of gets focused on. And I, I think so far what we've seen is really uh, decades of this exploration and maturation phase. Uh, and now with the DPDP bill, I think we finally come to the uh, third phase, which is the regulation phase. Um, so the first off, you know, if you just look at portfolio companies, I, I think like Goldie said, this is a change for them uh, because you know uh, staying with the cliche if data was indeed gold everybody wanted much more access to as much data as possible but again like goldie said the penalties are so high and the requirements for data processing are so wide and deep uh, that really there is a new reset now because data possibly can also be toxic if used wrongly or if uh, kind of uh, insecurely or, or in the case of breach. Uh, and therefore, uh, just thinking about portfolio companies itself, they will have to reset in terms of how they approach processes internally. Uh, and again, just given the intensity of uh, what needs to be done and so much data that has to be handled both in static form and in flow, uh, the role of technology and therefore what technology based solutions uh, can people use and can businesses use will become uh, really important in this scenario. I, I think the two, uh, you know, I would say cuts in terms of sectors that one will have to look at, especially one will be sectors which were anyway, uh, very data intensive. Uh, so that sectors like healthcare, BFSI, uh, insurance. I mean, these are sectors which um, <clears throat> over the last few decades have actually been able to do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, expanding of products and services and access and affordability uh, using technology. But it will also mean that these sectors and large market players who use data will really need to, in a sense, shape up on the compliance side first. Um, Having actually, you know, seen uh, the market over the last three decades, I, I kind of feel like I've seen this movie before, which is that when a regulation comes in, it makes us all feel like uh, how will lots of models survive? Uh, how will they kind of uh, thrive in the new world? But uh, honestly, I think the biggest learning is that most entrepreneurs are not really worried about regulations in an absolute sense. Uh, they are enterprising enough to possibly solve for that. The, bigger worry really is about relativity of regulations and what the dpdp bill has done is actually leveled the field uh, and if we look at therefore three sectors um, where data is widely used 
Um, one suggestion I have is uh, DSCI has actually come come up with three sets of guides, uh, which can be really used in these sectors. Uh, these guides were actually built before the bill came, but I think they will nevertheless be very useful. Uh, they have, first of all, quick self-assessment tools that businesses can use uh, to see where they are on various practices. Uh, they also talk through various data touch points, uh, the processing requirements that Goldie touched upon. Uh, and they also have fairly good illustrations and case studies and live examples about what each thing can mean. So when you say consent that's informed, uh, we can all have you know, rationally very different views about what that is. And these guides actually give some suggestions on that. Um, uh, I, I would actually just leave a thought uh, behind over here if industry bodies could use this as a starting point to maybe build standards and consensus across the sector. Uh, because like I said earlier, you know, it's not about absolute, but the relative, relativeness of some of these standards and regulations. If I might make a last point before signing off, which is that lastly, you know, we often think of regulation as a hurdle, but uh, frankly for companies, it can be also a huge enabler and a source of competitive advantage. Uh, as customers, you know, become more and more aware about the dangers of leaked data or risks arising out of their digital footprints, they might honestly actually look out for options uh, that give them more secure usage uh, of their data. And uh, hence, there's a real opportunity uh, to be privacy enhancing, to be privacy by design, and to showcase that as a competitive advantage. Um, I, I just want to end with you know what I think is a fabulous quote, given that it's Oppenheimer season. Uh, one of the physicists of that time, Zillard, uh, he said success is often not dependent on being the cleverest person on earth. It's often just about being one day early. Uh, and maybe it's an opportunity for businesses to think about being the early birds. And back to you, Neha. I think, uh, you know, a uh, couple of takeaways actually, Shilpa, which you just mentioned, one definitely on the standardization piece. And, uh, you know, at, at some point in time, there needs to be some sort of a code uh, of conduct or, you know, standardization that needs to be built up or strengthening the governance framework. Now, that will be largely driven from a regulatory compliance point of view. But also, I mean, it, it also brings in a lot of healthy uh, environment in which, you know, companies are maturing and, and therefore, you know, they're growing their businesses to that extent. And definitely, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, these kind of guardrails, effectively, once you start adopting it and, you know, it becomes part of your business, then it's not really compliance, compliance, but it becomes like, you know, daily operations per se. So definitely, it's, it's very important. Uh, so, Pratim, one question to you, since you deal with a lot of m &A transactions. So, uh, you know, what do you think the potential safeguards that investors should have specifically, you know, in cases of secondary sales or, or maybe, you know, specifically in data sharing agreements that they should definitely build up? So any reactions to that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Neha, for that question. I think very important uh, and timely because we are at a very interesting cusp, if you see. Um, when you're having transactions, you will have to actually see, uh, is the target entity compliant with the law up till now, with the present day law? And also, are they prepared for the future law? I think that's the lens to be applied. Now, if you look at a life, life cycle of any, any typical deal, you'll start with the term sheet, et cetera, and maybe even before that, the, the deal structuring, okay? What we are increasingly observing is that along with maybe tax structuring, there's a lot of data structuring which is happening now, okay? That, you know, where do I house the data? If there is a data localization uh, for certain countries, which, uh, you know, in the context of certain countries, if there's a negative list issued, do I have the ability to move the data into another jurisdiction? Things like those. Uh, so the first thing, again, is which is super important is the data structuring before you get into the deal. Then the next one is due diligence, okay? Um, and maybe we can talk from both sides, but I'll tell you your usual practice would be say you will find an Excel sheet in the data room, which has got a list of all the employees along with their corresponding bank account number and their salaries and all that. Is that really required? Possibly no. You just need to get bands of people and their corresponding uh, salary, et cetera. Also, if it is a CFO, CXO level person, maybe you can take specific consent and sort of give it. 
So these, this is something that you have to understand very carefully. Also at the at this level, you have to understand one very important thing that in the previous version of this, this law, the bill that was there, there was an attempt to give a clean leeway to MA. Okay. Mergers and acquisitions were supposed to be there, but it got changed in the final version. And the act, if you look at it, the leeway provided is only a minuscule leeway where you have schemes of arrangement as ANCLT driven processes, etc. It's only then that you don't need any consent. Otherwise, let's take an example. If, say, a database is moving from entity A to entity B, technically speaking, you will have to take consent from each and employee, every employee and each and every customer data that is moving, which is quite a bit of a red flag, I would say. And we need to be careful when we are looking at transactions. Okay, Coming to the next phase of a deal, which is documentation. So like we were discussing, Goldie also mentioned, if you see that the entire liability or responsibility is that on the data controller or data fiduciary, as it is called, there's almost nothing in the head of a data processor. So depending on what hat you're wearing as that target, I think it should be checked that do I have enough insulation? Suppose you are a, that target entity is a data controller. Does that have enough insulation for all the processing that it is giving someone else to do. So that's in us as a snapshot, you know, this, this whole transactional. And now coming to that last phase, say, of uh, uh, which you were talking about is that data sharing agreements, et cetera, what happens to those, say, who are an, uh, uh, an investor who's exiting, okay? You need to be very careful there. Also, many a times we have seen post-transactional restructuring happens, okay, in relation to data. In that case, it's not a one-day exercise, right? When two entities are getting separated and data is moving from A to B, uh, it's a transitional phase. And maybe the giver of data will actually facilitate this movement for some point in time, uh, for some time till it goes to the new entity. Till that time, they are providing some transitional services. Who are those people who are giving those services? What do what kind of grip do you have about uh, you know on those people? The kind of movement that is taking place is it's a is it a clean movement, etc. So all of these, I think, uh, you know, if you if you look at it, the whole life cycle, I think, has to be looked at it from a very different lens right now. And I would say, pick each and every case, consider them separately, also from a data perspective. We have spoken enough till now. If you understand that, if for example, the target is handling children's personal data, the sensitivity should go up manifold. Okay, and also. Things like, say, consumer data, if, this, if they're heavy on consumer data, you have to be, you know, uh, more careful about it. Uh, if by chance, if you're, there's a possibility of getting categorized as a significant data fiduciary, right, additional obligations will come up. So I, I think I can go on and on, but that's a, that's a snapshot from my side. No, no, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, these are very, very important aspects because, you know, this entire life cycle, each of our investors actually go through. And therefore, you know, each of the facets, everybody can completely correlate to, especially, you know, whether it is, you know, data room access or even building up that in your agreements, whether with respect to indemnity or, you know, uh, in terms of the valuation. Definitely. I mean, this is this is definitely important. Ashish, back to you, um, you know, on, uh, on a question that... Uh, since you know a uh, lot of a uh, lot of times we have seen that VCs also represent in the board of the companies, and uh, you know uh, in case you know things are there, and you know we've seen the quantum of penalties. So there is also an exposure that the director who's representing the investor can also have. So any any thoughts on that? That you know how you are looking at it? No, I I, I do feel that uh, like it is true for every other piece of legislation. As a board member, there will be a certain burden uh, cast on the investor director as well. And uh, whatever uh, one may say, at the end of it, it is not just about the legality of it or the anxiety about a hefty fine that the Indian law provides. And unfortunately, uh, that fine is devoid or uh, completely ob oblivious of the fact that whether your turnover is X or 10X. Two companies with very different turnovers could have a similar fine structure. So that so those those are the things that I would be a little more concerned about. Uh, but the obligation, I think, we will have to take it and gear up towards ensuring that the companies do go through internal systemic checks, like you see in every organization which has scaled beyond a point 
you would have a dual mechanism of uh, internal controls and external validations of those controls. We will have to go through that as well. And the systems will have to first make sure that at the outset, we are not collecting more data than what we need. I think so far as you are able to ensure that the quantum that you are needing is what you collect and the utility is in accordance with your business, I do feel that half the battle is taken care of. And post that is something that one will have to uh, be reliant on the company systems and the management. Uh, beyond that, I do, that will be a risk that an investor does right. You will have to take the safety protocols and all that, but nothing much more that you can do. At the end of it, the four ways in which I split this, you are moving towards something which is going to only help uh, the ecosystem in general. Let's do it sooner than later. There is a clear purpose and end use of what we are trying to do. Uh, the accuracy, etc., always was something that a good company would take care of it. That's the third aspect of it. The fourth is the accountability. The fourth is where I worry because in this, I wanted to just highlight the fact that when it comes to the way the government tends to use the data, they are there are exemptions around it. I'm not a lawyer, but when you are in a financial services business, the government in some sense does have businesses that are going to end up competing what you do. So no longer the prism of uh, it's no, it's not the government's business to be in business is true. The government is going to be in business and you are going to have a competitor on the other side where the rules, level playing rules are going to be missing. So how do you handle that is something that time will uh, show us. But yeah, these are the bigger, wider consequences that we will have to embrace upon. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, this is, this is, you know, part of the, the, you know, the strengthening the governance process, because at the end of the day, I mean, we see that there are a lot of legislations which have, you know, these kind of consequences. And now this is in addition to it. So definitely, I mean, uh, all of this will ultimately lead to, you know, doing a better governance process. Uh, so but then a related question on this, uh, you know, uh, since we are talking about, uh, you know, the breaches and the liabilities, uh, it's also important to see that, you know, do you also see that there should be a need for a standardized reporting mechanism for breach, uh, you know, under the act? And therefore, you know, do you suggest any kind of a procedures that, you know, should be involved where the parties are informed uh, on the, you know, reasonable timelines for how they should, you know, be reported of the breach, etc. So any, any reactions on that? Yeah, I think uh, we can take some cue from uh, some of the foreign jurisdictions who have had this law for some time. But even in India, I would say we have had this precedent of reporting a cybersecurity incident to the CERT in Computer Emergency Response Team of India. We would be all aware that about a year back, uh, we had this certain direction which said that within six hours of observing a, a breach or a, a cybersecurity incident or being informed about it, you are required to report it to CERT in. So we always had that form which was there and you know, you're supposed to report it. These days, they've also become very proactive by the way. Um, they are themselves going to the dark webs, taking screenshot of, of Indian companies' data being up for sale and coming back and writing to the companies. Um, so coming back to your point, I think reporting definitely should be standardized because otherwise it, it creates a panic. Okay, If you look at the GDPR reporting format, it has very interesting stuff like in relation to the, to the particular breach. Stuff like, you know, were those people who were involved in the organization, uh, uh, they were trained or not, okay? So these are things which, if you see, largely you can pre-populate and keep, you know, what's the business, what's this, what's the size, et cetera, et cetera. So a number of things you can keep uh, prepared and also have a playbook within your organization if the overall system is standardized. Another problem which we should sort of flag out to the government, to my mind, is that um, we have multiple reportings today at our hand, okay, cybersecurity incident, which in all or almost all probabilities will also trigger a requirement under the DPDP Act and will require us to also go to the Data Protection Board and report. Um, that will be, say, the second reporting. First one would be probably CERT and then the DPDP. And if you're a sector regulated entity, then third, that will be the third one. So why don't we unify this process? Okay, that's one. In certain jurisdiction, it is actually. You just need to make one reporting and it goes to the relevant regulators internally within the system. So I think we should slowly move to that direction. Back to you. 
Uh, no, absolutely right. And, you know, we've also seen that, you know, uh, 69A has been exercised many times of blocking. So again, you know, there are different powers and we've seen that blocking uh, powers are also vesting under DPDP. So to that extent, I mean, there, there are guards and there are checks which are there in place. But I think from a user perspective, reporting perspective, it, it should become a very seamless kind of an experience, definitely. Uh, one question to Shilpa. Uh, Shilpa, since we've seen that, you know, Omidyar has been really bouncing and very, very prevalent on the privacy tech thesis. So, uh, you know, uh, based on your learnings, global learnings, anything that you would want to really, uh, you know, uh, talk about that, you know, how, how you have seen that happening. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Neha. So, uh, you know, our thesis uh, over the last decade had always been that technology and entrepreneurship will redraw the paradigm of affordability, access and choice across many things like financial inclusion, education, and I think all of us have seen that play out. Uh, but we've also spent some time thinking about the needs that businesses will have uh, to do business in a way that protects the interests of the consumer, especially in relation to the all pervasive data footprint. Uh, so we had actually published our privacy tech thesis for investing in businesses and startups uh, uh, <clears throat> to really focus on um, uh, uh, startups that will support businesses to be more responsible stewards of data or enable individuals to take direct control of their data. And there are six areas that we look at, and I'm sure others can also you know, kind of dive into uh, which is about data compliance and management, data minimization, uh, maybe better encryption, identity verification, identity management, and of course, uh, privacy forward consumer products. So these are areas that you know we've uh, actually been actively looking at. Uh, one area which I think particularly important for India is startups who are actually focused on uh, small businesses in the country. Uh, because as we've become like, you know, India, in a sense, we've leapfrogged digitally and therefore we're really a tech first market uh, for not just private sector, but also for government services. Uh, what that means is really the risks of data attack uh, and data breach are quite high and we've increasingly seen India being a focus of uh, such attacks. Um, so therefore, really, you know, to our minds, um, there is a space for actually encouraging startups uh, in this sector. And we've been investing in a number of such uh, uh, entrepreneurs over the last few years. Um, and I, I think just like India has become a lighthouse country in delivering through digital means, I think we also have the potential uh, to become a lighthouse country that does this uh, keeping security and privacy of consumers in mind uh, and the dpdp bill was a good uh, you know step forward towards that thanks that's that's useful uh, to hear from you shilpa um, one question from uh, ashish uh, you know since you know uh, we ha you've seen that you know how early stage uh, you know startups actually migrate into the matured startups you know the businesses grow and, uh, you know, DPDP has a window for startups, you know, providing an exemption. So uh, from your perspective, I mean, any suggestions that you would want to really place that, you know, how the migration should happen, what kind of protection should be given, uh, you know, uh, to different portfolio companies in that respect, wherein at least, you know, it's, it's becoming very seamless, uh, you know, uh, uh, from a protection point of view, and it doesn't become a bizarre situation. So any reactions on that? Uh, Neha, thanks for that question. A uh, very pertinent one. Uh, I might sound a little bit uh, idealist and be more than happy to take divergent views uh, from not only fellow panelists and you, but also the audience. So I do feel that when it comes to compliance, let's go back uh, just two steps and take it 20 years ago. Unfortunately, the era was such that governance and compliance were uh, differentiating factors between great companies and not so great uh, businesses, which attracted certain investment uh, from global investors and Indian investors. And within that also, not everybody was the same, but yeah, there was that bit of concern that people had when it came to the businesses. I think the so far as we all agree, which we do, that this is in the right direction. It is something that is very healthy and allows us to 
keep our uh, consumers and people involved in a certain check, it needs to be embraced full fledged. I don't think we should take the luxury of those exemptions because startups grow at a very fast pace. You have one round of funding or back to back two rounds of funding and you are shifting orbits. At that point in time to start making fundamental shifts to the architecture of the product designs and all that so that you are going to be better compliant of that. Those are not easy mindset shifts. So might as well embrace it and take the take the whole opportunity to move uh, cleanly enough. And I do feel that rewards of these will come in more ways than one. At the end of the day, if the customer is going to feel so much more secured, the business is going to be much more at a premium. We, we can debate this to death, but this is an idealistic view that I do hold. There is a cost of compliance, which I am aware of. So, so my rationalization and summary of this is, take it like a religious practice. Those who are completely unable to, of course, you have the exemption. But to the extent you can, don't take uh, coverage under shelters, uh, comply and pursue. No, I think, I mean, uh, thanks, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Pratham. Thanks, Shilpa. Thanks, Shashish. And I think everybody, I mean, uh, when I hear, you know, in the last 30 minutes conversation, it's actually leading to, you know, strengthening everybody's consistent that, you know, governance needs to be strengthened. And therefore, you know, everybody is not really having a, uh, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, it's, it's an acceptance mode, I think, because, I mean, the law is there. Now it's, it's a matter of, you know, how fast we really gear up and, you know, the rules will definitely tell that, you know, what could be the process difficulties in terms of implementation. So I think to that extent, I mean, uh, definitely a very uh, interesting conversation. There are some questions that have come up in the chat box. We'll take it up at the end of the session. Thanks. Over to you, Sriram. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I make this one point if that's okay? Is Goldie here? Yeah. So I think next up, uh, we can move to the founders panel. Thank you, uh, Supratyam. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you, Neha. Thank you, Ashish for joining us. So next up, I'd like to hand over the stage to Joyce uh, to moderate the Founders Panel and take it over. Over to you, Joyce. Sure, thanks, Sriram. Uh, but I think Goldie was trying to say something. Goldie, do you still want to say uh, oh, something? Sorry. I just wanted to say one quick thing. I think one realization which I've had with talking to multiple companies is that while people, uh, most organizations think of this as a compliance burden and certainly is, but it also allows companies to think through whether they're really monetizing the data which they're collecting. And uh, at least some of the discussions I've had is that people are saying that, you know, this data I never knew that I'm holding and I can actually monetize it. So uh, organizations can also wear a business hat to see what data they hold and then how you can monetize it if you really want to hold that data and process it. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Goldie, and uh, thanks, Neha, and uh, it was a very interesting, um, uh, you know, panel discussion, and uh, it's um, it's definitely um, very encouraging to hear investors, you know, say this is, you know, understand and see how this is important. Um, so I think I'm using two different, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I have an issue with my laptops. So I'm using two devices, which is why you'll see me twice. Um, so, uh, it's, 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 um, uh, I myself was confused as to what I was saying. Sorry about that. Um, but then it's, it's pretty interesting and, um, happy to hear that actually, you know, it sounds like, uh, there's a the right set of encouragement, motivation, etc. So I'd like to, um, now probably start the next panel. Let me see if we have all the panelists in the call. Um, uh, yes, we have sure. all of them choice. All right, great. Um, so um, just a quick introduction. I'm Joyce Rodericks. I'm a partner with Deloitte India Cybersecurity Practice based in Mumbai. Uh, 20 years of uh, experience in uh, IT and cyber uh, across different roles um, and uh, with different organizations doing, um, you know, practically everything under uh, uh, under the technology stack, I would say. Um, and I have with me in my panel, uh, Shobit Chandra from Khaitan. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Shobit? Um, thanks for that. Hi, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Shobit. I'm a counsel in the TMT and data protection practice groups at Khaitan and Company's Delhi office. Uh, really excited to be here and part of uh, be a part of this uh, particular discussion. Thank you. All right. 
and um, thanks Shobhit Akansh uh, from the TH from THP. Hi, this is Akansh. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of THP. THP is a healthcare technology company serving large healthcare enterprises. Hello, thanks Akansh and Rahul uh, from CloudSec. Yeah, hi. So we at, we at CloudSec um, build technology that predicts cyber threats. It's very similar to how we predict rain today. We build unique data sets, cybersecurity data sets and machine learning models and we combine that together. Uh, I run, I founded the company almost uh, eight years back uh, um, and building the team and the culture. All right, thanks Rahul. Uh, Shriyam, uh, we're missing uh, Ashok. Uh, oh, I'm here. From ID5. Oh, sorry, I I'm couldn't here. see you. Oh, sorry, Ashok, couldn't see you. Ashok, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashok. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of ID5. Um, we are a platform which uh, you know uh, eliminates uh, fraud and establishes trust in transactions. Uh, to that extent, uh, we, I'm very passionate about the DPDP bill and uh, data production as well. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for the introduction. So we've, um, you know, we uh, we've heard the investors talking about, um, uh, you know, how this, um, you know, how to receive this act basically, and how to look at it in a positive light beyond just compliance. Uh, so you know, India has about, um, you know, twenty thousand, twenty seven thousand plus tech startups, um, and um, a, a good number of them are, you know, deep tech startups dealing with a lot of data as well. Uh, and uh, also personal data. Um, so, and maybe, you know, uh, I probably would like to start with Akansh. You know, so you you also have a, a platform that uh, that deals with healthcare data and healthcare analytics data platform. So our tech, is, you know, our tech ecosystem, technology ecosystem is heading towards a fully digital uh, set of offerings, like how you offer as part of your services as well. And, um, uh, you know, data, uh, data has become quite central to how, uh, these services are being positioned in the market or uh, how these positions how these services are also being positioned from you know as an integrator as well so it has become a you know the analytics around the data itself has become quite key as well so we're seeing a lot of emerging solutions that are either part of an end-to-end -end b2c offering or you know uh, probably a b2c offering in itself itself um with this kind of focus on data um, uh, on some of these technology solutions, and uh, you know, I have three different, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, technology. Um, uh, I would say I have three very different technology uh, service providers over here. But just specifically from your data platform standpoint, Akansh, how do you, how are you receiving this act actually, and uh, what do you see this implication from um, the serve solutions and services that you provide? Uh, I'd also like to ask you, are you hearing anything from your investors or, you know, your customers as well? Um, and, you know, are you getting any uh, feedback questions around, uh, you know, uh, the whole response to this act itself? No, thank you for uh, thank you for asking that question and uh, glad to be here on the panel. Uh, just for context, uh, THP builds healthcare data platforms for healthcare enterprises, including a hospital, a pharma company. And therefore, by the nature of work that we do, uh, we actually consolidate all the data that's spread across their systems at one place, help them then enable various use cases and applications. So literally data is our bread and butter uh, and healthcare data sets specifically are fairly sensitive uh, because of the clinical nature of that data uh, and the possible misuse that it can create. Uh, you know, it's almost sort of, you know, I think financial and healthcare are two ecosystems where data actually is, is very sensitive. Uh, and we happen to be sort of looking at one of those ecosystems very closely. I think there are three or four things happening right now, uh, you know, and, and we've been sort of building this platform for the last five years plus now. And I think the level of conversations that used to happen early years versus the level of conversations that happen in the current era are very, very different. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, so various acts coming in, but also at the same time, the fact that the... Uh, the customers that we work with, these large hospitals, pharma companies, are also evolving on the path of setting their data on a cloud. So this whole cloudization of data is also another piece that's happening, which also brings in more of these questions around security. Uh, now, the good thing is that people see the benefits of agility and, and scalability and, and easy maintenance of the cloud, but at the same time, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, the second thing that's happening is that 
a lot of people uh, you know and anything in our case we are not a b2c platform we are a b2b platform uh, so a lot of these discussions happen at the start and at the setup stage of the enterprise data platform so before it goes to production it needs to go through a penetration testing it needs to go through a vapt it needs to go through a you know a soc 2 it needs to have these certifications so what happens is this kind of really becomes a one time significant activity to kind of cross that threshold and then you know that after that both when the customer are fairly sort of confident then you kind of we look at it from time to time but really you know it becomes a little bit of so i think there is very heavy bar at that stage where people are kind of making that move you know taking a significant action and so on and so forth uh and you know the other technology is all fair bit right you know so access to data etc are now fairly controlled it's you know dual authentication you know and and so on and so forth so i think that people are less worried about uh but the, those are those are couple of things that are very actively moving but there's a lot of bug talking of investors investors at the time of investing actually care about this a lot right so at that time they'll do a due diligence now very you know we never used to have technical due diligence but now over the last sort of two years there's a full dedicated one month activity that happens on doing a due diligence on technology as well that security is a part of the work stream so i think investors have become a little bit more conscious again it's one of those things they want to look at before they come in uh it's they have all these clauses around protecting them against any data breaches so they they put in all those clauses uh and then from a customer perspective i think given the ecosystem shift and the fact that they're setting up these platforms you know there's a big activity that happens at the start and then kind of things become a little bit more normalized after that i'll take a pause but you know those are the kind of things that we're seeing in the market sure so thanks for sharing that akansh so um you know we've seen the evolution of um, uh, you know i would say this the whole security itself say so the security protection and everything uh, so yes there is initially you know a need for technology the technology comes in and then there is an abuse and then there is uh, you know uh, means to you know stop the abuse so security was one and then uh, when there is a proliferation of uh, data and misuse of data and obviously you know the uh, uh compromising on the identity privacy of individuals etc breaching tra- breach of trust etc then the whole privacy laws emerged around it so we've seen that as an evolution right aganj so you touch beautifully on you know how um, you uh, you know uh, both as a uh, you know as a, as a startup company you know you look at security and your investors also look at it from that standpoint uh and uh you know there is this journey also at every country also is going through that you've looked at security now we're starting to look at privacy as well so from that perspective uh for the kind of uh, data that you deal with the kind of solutions and the customers you deal with where does privacy come into the picture and um, and how are you going to deal with that any differently post dbdpa no oh, and and i'm i'm glad that you asked this and uh i think there's this thing about the act but since you mentioned about the countries i, I must tell you you know i'm in, i'm actually taking this call from dubai right now we have a big mock okay. event happening here and you know there was a time uh when we used to get the directory of all the attendees of the conferences you know for us to kind of work with them very closely and now nobody shares the phone numbers and the email ids and the private information right they just give you the list of attendees and you figure it out yourself so i think people are taking privacy really seriously uh i think especially these these countries which have an influence of gdpr in some form or shape uh so they take it very seriously uh i think you know because of the fragmentation of the country like india uh you know you will have all kinds of anecdotal examples you'll have people who will still continue to share excel sheets with all kind of private information and i don't think anyone's even monitoring them closely and then there are these big enterprises that you work with who are fairly conscious about it now and uh, do try and maintain some protocols and especially some of the public listed ones and i won't mention names of those companies here but i have some public listed customers who had their data breaches on the servers right so it's made them really sort of conscious about you know how do we deal with data such like this so you know it's like one of those things uh, you know as i say dood ka jala charge ko bhi phuk phuk ke bhi tar so it's one of those things where people who kind of seem that once are even more careful about it then there's this tier large enterprises who are being proactively and then there's this huge long tail of you know companies who i don't think still care about it but i think it's going to just start changing it, it's not something that happens overnight it will take years for for people to kind of really be conscious about these things but but the change is with it sure 
Thanks, Akansh. So maybe uh, just moving on and to a totally different type of a service and solutions that you provide, Ashok, uh, as part of ID5. Um, so uh, you're into, uh, you know, uh, providing various types of services where you act as a data processor to a lot of data fiduciaries uh, by running back, you know, conducting background check services and uh, maybe KYC validation kind of services, etc. So how are you seeing, you know, this act uh, and what will be the impact to uh, the likes of you who act mostly as a data processor? Um, so, uh, you know, how do you want to drive compliance to the services that you are providing to your customers? And why do you think it becomes important both from, you know, uh, the way you serve your customers, but also the way you're, uh, you know, how it impacts your business and growth as well? Um, so I'm going to step back before I give my answer to that. One is um, as a as a citizen of the country, I'm, I'm really scared of the kind of data that people have about me and the way they use it. I think it, it, if I look at most companies, I think the way we deal with personal data is rather frivolous. <clears throat> um, uh, case in point is the number of builders who call me on a daily basis because I posted some rental, uh, you know, flat in, uh, on one of the websites, right? And after that, I get calls on a daily basis. I, I get, I counted this. This is about 25 calls I get every day. Right. Um, so as a data uh, fiduciary, this data fiduciary has sent my data to a bunch of people because of marketing purposes or whatever. And I have no recourse uh, as a as a citizen to actually either get my data deleted or even they also don't know how they are, uh, who they have sent my data to. This might have been like, uh, like Akank said, this might have been passed by an Excel. This might have been passed as a as a request for some other processing or rather like, you know, or even actually, to be honest, no consent was taken for a specific purpose, right? So uh, from a consent and 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 and, and spe specified purpose perspective, they might have taken my data for one purpose and using it for something else. So so as a, as a concerned citizen, uh, so the way, the, way I, the way I look at it is uh, we have, at ID5, at least we have always been a little more careful about how we process data and how we delete data. So we, I'm a data processor, but we uh, we pretty much have a, a, a purge purge policy, which is instant. So we don't we don't hold any data for longer than uh, than the processing time in any case, unless the customer wants it to, and it is in a data vault, uh, which which essentially is only accessible by the customer through uh, his own specified key, which is. Which is encrypted using that key. So, so from a uh, from a perspective of how we have dealt with that data, we have been careful from day one. Um, having said that, I do think uh, there is an opportunity for people like us because we we are looking at how how do I build data governance as a platform um, to provide to uh, to our customers so that it makes their life easier in the way they govern data in in in, in some sense. Uh, and data governance, in my opinion, is larger than what I would call uh, consent management. Um, it is it is about who who are the processors you are transferring the data to. How are, what data has been transferred to that pro processor? What uh, what uh, consent you have gotten? What purpose that consent was for? Um, at, to some extent, consent is immutable, right? Like for example, I got my consent now, but tomorrow, the way we look at it is we have to go beyond the checkbox uh, because. Mm -hmm. You have you would have given consent for something, and then you have changed the terms and conditions on your website. Doesn't mean you have got my consent for the new terms and conditions. So you, there is literally, uh, so you have you have an immutable consent uh, which I was initially given, and then a new consent has been taken for a new purpose, right? So so uh, I in in our opinion, it is an opportunity for us to provide the data governance platform as part of our service layer. Uh, and that's sort of what IDFI is doing. So we we are very closely monitoring as well as building platform for compliance, uh, for for data governance compliance uh, specifically. Um, but but I I uh, I really hope the customer like my, the data fiduciary treat my data with uh, the respect that it deserves because I don't think uh, uh, any of I can't name a single company which is doing it properly. Well, thanks, uh, Ashok. Well, indeed, it does, um, Ashok. And um, it's interesting, um, uh, you know, because I think services like yours would have already thought about this ahead of time, right, when you're even designing that services. And it is the same sort of a mindset that we need 
uh, for just treating any other data actually you know uh, or any other data processing activity that we would have thought through for you know uh, an activity like a bgb or anything as such uh, and you're right you know in, in having good data governance is the best way to establish trust there um i would also like to ask uh, maybe you know rahul's uh, you know uh, how are you seeing you know uh, uh, this whole act uh, you know what is the relevance of it from uh, the services and solutions that you provide as cloud sec you know it's a very different set of cyber security services that you provide uh but what's the relevance of the act to yourself uh, as uh, as a data fiduciary as a data processor also because you also do uh, you know uh, collect some kind of uh, data for your various monitoring activities etc uh you know how is how are you planning to you know uh, take the next course of actions uh, you know around uh, uh, around driving compliance to this uh, whole dpdb yeah absolutely um so for for cloudsex perspective you know this is one of the best things that has happened to us the last many many years right but then uh, from a business perspective everything we have been building now is getting mandated by a regulator saying that you need to have this and now like, like but more than from a business perspective i think this is a huge win for consumers i'll give you a few examples why this is a huge win for consumers um by the way what cloudcheck does is we 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 have a deep end dark web monitor we have a data leak monitor which which identifies if any of your information has been ever leaked online or not and we have a brand monitor which identifies impersonations etc cetera, etc cetera. now let me go connect what the bill talks about the bill very specifically talks about giving control to individuals and their data and how it is being handled and if it's handled in the wrong way what are the penalties that or the what are the fines that can be imposed on the companies you know by misutilizing individual data uh, two it also talks about keeping the data inside the country not leaving it you know uh, not leaving taking it outside for processing uh, and three how your data is collected and you need to be made aware how it is being going to be utilized right this is on a high level uh, the, the the on a high level what the bill talks about let me ask you one simple question right um how many of you have a insurance um you know uh, today any sort of insurance i think all of us will have at least one of it and how many of you believe what is the kind of data the insurance companies have on you your pi information uh you know right well that's what you believe on a high level very recently we've been working with one of uh you know we've been engaged with one of the digital um insurance providers on online insurance providers what we found was something shocking that see each time a company buys an insurance from a larger player like say cloudcheck buys an insurance the hospitals basically share every employee information every information of our employees that means that basically means what are the medic what are the treatments they took what are the medications he is taking what are the surgeries he is taking uh you know how much they paid for those surgeries pretty much every information about my employee which is lying with the hospital is also lying in the infrastructure of the insurance companies and when we were working with one of the insurance companies we understood that anybody on the internet can pretty much keep a take a copy of not just my company pretty much any large company which is out there and 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 i don't want my i don't want my diseases or the diseases i have to be a public information i am pretty sure nobody wants it either right so the the problem here is that nobody knows what are the kind of data i have given or you know or a party i am associated with has on me and how securely they are keeping them in the first place right uh you know so when it comes to this act and what cloudsec does one we have the capability to identify where all you know because most of the cyber attack happens on the external infrastructure you know people normally get information on from an infrastructure which is publicly exposed not from an internal server you know very least it happens but most high profiles attacks happen in that way 
So most companies or most CISOs have no idea where their data is sitting or whether any of them is sitting on a computer which is exposed onto the internet. That's point number one. We give them the visibility for that. Two, we give them not just that visibility, we also tell them what sort of information can potentially leak from these servers or computers which are sitting on the internet exposed infrastructure. We put them under the attack surface monitoring category. Uh, three, we can also tell you whether any of this information which has been collected and stored is in any way moving out from the country. Because what happens is, and I'll give you a very simple thing. Many companies unknowingly put a, you know, let's say a form where you fill in information and information is going to um, insurance company. The insurance company would have put three different trackers on that website to do certain post-processing of that information. It's the marketing team does that all the time. But then these, the, you know, these post-processing scripts which are run in the background are pretty much all of them taking some information and moving it out of India. That itself will become a huge violation of uh, DPD, right? So we, we, we can provide information uh, to that as well. And as, uh, so, so that's in a in a nutshell, you know, what we offer and how it's super relevant to our company as well as offer more more to the consumers. Well, thanks, Rahul. I think you're right. You know, so um, uh, there's there's definitely a lot of uh, data every organization has uh, out there, and a lot of times unaware unaware of it as well. And but on you know uh, I am little conscious of the time as well, and I do want to you know uh, bring Shobit on board as well. Shobit, you know, uh, as a legal counsel, um, you know, and, uh, the act uh, the act definitely talks about an applicability. Uh, it has uh, exemptions to the applicability, and it has yeah. um, it has a legitimate use also uh, cases for legitimate use as well. Um, so just keeping uh, this in mind, right, uh, what would your recommendation be uh, for, you know, uh, for especially for technology solution uh, driven providers, uh, solution providers, um, right. as, and those who deal with large volumes of data and personal data as well, what steps right. they should start, you know, what, what should they start thinking about, you know, from a legal perspective to start becoming more compliant? Um, yeah. And then, you know, uh, we'll come uh, come back on you know the bigger value beyond compliance as well no absolutely Joyce and uh, I think if I could just begin by saying that all the insights that have been shared by Akanj, Rahul and Ashok uh, really uh, give a, a deep uh, uh, look into you know the kind of priority and emphasis that is being given by a lot of startups to to this domain uh, but having said that I think uh, as a systemic change or as, as something that perhaps should be done across the board, I think is, is probably to look at the low hanging fruits to begin with and uh, paying close attention to the fundamental data protection principles. So, and some of which are already enshrined in the existing law as well as, uh, and, are, and are sought to be reinforced by what the DPDPA promises to be. So, so things like data minimization, right? I think all of us really touched upon this aspect, how Ashok was sort of agitated by the fact that he's getting calls from various real estate builders, or uh, as, as Rahul had mentioned, that when it comes to insurance companies, there are a host of uh, data sets that are, that are plucked out for a particular individual. Um, I think it really pegs the question as to what are really the data sets that we need to know for a particular purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of those would really be dictated by the thing that you're trying to do there. So there is a tendency at times to perhaps collect a, a awful large amount of data, which may not be necessary at, at a given point. So I think that is something that needs to be looked at, of course, with some uh, some leeway for ancillary uses, it may not be able uh, to like conclusively say so that these are all the purposes that I'm going to use it for, but but definitely some thought needs to be given to that. Um, the other aspect is also regarding the storage of that data. So storage, both in terms of the, the security controls that are employed, as well as the time period for which it is going to be stored. So um, there is this concept of storage limitation as well, where data has to be purged uh, after it's 
on its intended use or when there's a withdrawal of the consent. And uh, from the other side of the coin, uh, looking at it from the security controls that need to be employed, right? So one is, of course, to ensure overall compliance with the law. But in particular, um, uh, there are now very specific obligations regarding reporting of personal data breaches as well, and all of which uh, carry a fairly, fairly hefty penalty, as we've seen in the beginning of the session. So these are items, to my mind, which would require a, a close look in because uh, we need to sort of address those issues that uh, uh, need to be dealt with at the beginning, um, and where you know, there is likelihood of uh, a significant exposure, say, if things, uh, things go south. Okay. So, you know, thanks for sharing your insight, Shubha. So, then on the, you know, uh, that's on the compliance side, um, but then uh, the compliance and non-compliance is obviously has consequences as well with penalties associated with it. So, um, uh, you know, from that standpoint, Shubhad, do you also think um, uh, from an investor perspective, um, yeah. is this the beginning of, you know, a new set of eval metrics for evaluation, evaluating, you know, a company as well? You know, the liability that a company also covers, uh, you know, carries with uh, the kind of data that they deal with. Absolutely. So I, I think that's firstly is a, a question is absolutely pertinent. And I think the, with the times and how they're evolving, um, what we've also seen is that there's a lot of impetus and emphasis that is given to these aspects going uh you know going forward and it's only increasing with each passing day so this is definitely a very critical metric when it comes to assessing the valuation of the company i think which is why it warrants that kind of uh close look in because you know you know in addition to your valuation this is a sort of an intangible element that you need to be conscious of and how you are dealing with data, how your, you know, your overall, overall practices are in relation to data protection and, and securing, securing privacy uh, will really go a long way in terms of, you know, uh, as far as the valuation and other considerations go from an investor point of view as well. Yeah, thanks, Shobit. Um, I'd like to just go around. You know, does anybody else, uh, you know, uh, Akansh, Ashok, Rahul, you know, based on what we've heard so far from each other and Shobit as well, in terms of uh, the need to, you know, take that action right now and how this might entail, um, you know, a new set of, um, you know, priorities also probably for in, uh, each organization. Any any last thoughts or comments you'd like to share? Yeah. Uh, sure. you know, no, no, you I, go ahead and then I'll tell. All right, all right, all right. thank you. Um, you know, so I think when it comes to data security, right, now I'll tell you what, I mean, we being a cybersecurity country, company, we spend a lot of money for our own security. We would not know we are one of the most attacked companies as well. But then yet it's very difficult to defend right? because you just have to make one mistake. But what is happening in the space is that most companies are are sitting on deni deniable. Uh, they're on a deniable, you know, uh, situation. Why? Because I'll give you an example. There was a CISO of, you know, this is a thousand uh, people company. I was just having a conversation. They were CISO. They're saying that, hey, I don't have any data on cloud because he heard my company, CloudSec, I've been introduced to you know, CloudSec. Though we are not a cloud security company, we are a threat intelligence company. So it's like, yeah, we don't do anything to do with cloud security. Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, understand, you know, you're, you're not on the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then later I went back and checked. Uh, we have this free tool called B Vision. Okay, what it does is it, it has analyzed every mobile app in the world. So you can go to bvision.com and search the name of any company. It'll give you the security score of that app. So I searched the company name, this company's name. They have an app, HRMS app. That means every employee, has to install that app on their phone to track their attendance, leave request, salary, uh, TDS, pay slips, everything comes on that app, right? Now, and this app has a major flow. That means anyone on the internet can literally leave, read every salary information of every employee in that organization. Now, remember the first statement he said, they don't have cloud. 
okay what is cloud cloud is actually someone else's computer a computer you don't manage this mobile app was managed by a third party company running on the third party company's cloud but has pretty much all the employee information of this company so the point i'm trying to make is when i say deniability uh, a lot of people don't understand that this is how things are working um so obviously this data is on the cloud you know cloud is someone else's computer that you don't manage uh, <clears throat> So my point is that I think a lot more awareness has to kick in. I believe these sort of uh, regulations will force people to rethink on some of these aspects, but I think it's in a good direction uh, and eventually we'll reach that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 um, I would like to say uh, one thing, right? Um, in the, for us, um, or how I think companies should be thinking about it uh, from a governance perspective, it's a three-pronged ap approach, right? There's, process people and technology and all three have to kind of come together in order to get proper governance because <clears throat> technology can only do so much uh there, there are people leakages there are process leaks and and when a company is really looking at uh, how how their function works they need to think about that and let me give you an example of that let's say there is a there is this uh co-branded card uh by uh co-branded credit card swiggy and hdfc right there are two data fiduciaries there. One is Swiggy, other one is other other one is HDFC. HDFC then transfers that data to uh, to probably some uh, SMS provider, a Gupshup, etc., who has data. Uh, basically, they are the ones who are sending SMSs to me. So that's a data processor number one. Then that probably that data then goes to TransUnion to do a civil check, another data processor. Third, it probably goes to some uh, company like a Pfizer, which is actually doing uh, uh, a credit card management. That's your third guy. It comes to me, which is, uh, I'm a KYC company, so the user's data comes to me. Then it goes to some guy who's probably going to the courier company, which is couriering this, uh, this uh, card to uh, the end pr uh, data principal. So now you have five, six people within that chain who are a bunch of processors in processing that one um, credit card, right? And not to mention then there might be other players who are then printing the card and, and there might be a, a, a sales force which is holding the customer data, which is on the cloud. So the real question is, does HDFC uh, or Swiggy know how that, uh, who all have touched my data, number one? Number two, have they deleted the data in after processing it? Or number three, when I I have a right to uh, you know I have a right for revocation. When I revoke revoke that uh, that my data uh, uh, from any of these companies, do they then go and make sure that these data processors are then revoking that? Uh, I mean, uh, deleting that data, right? That's that involves uh, all three of these. It, it it cannot be solved just through technology, but there has to be a process element to it. There has to be a, a, a people element to it. And I think uh, it it requires a lot more thinking through uh, than just uh, I would say the way we we think that this can be solved through technology. It's not going to happen that way. Uh, I just want to leave that thought. Sure, thanks, um, uh, Ashok and Rahul. You know, uh, I think uh, there are very uh, good takeaways, right? I think uh, one, I think it's it's there is a good recognition of the significance of this act in itself. And the value that we see beyond just uh, the compliance to it, and how do we, you know, provide our services and solutions more responsibly? So, thank you for sharing your insights. Um, it was an uh, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. And on that note, I'd like to hand it back to Shriram. Um, thank you, thank you, Joyce. Um, now I'd like to hand it over to Neha uh, for sort of moderating the Q and A. So, Neha, yeah, over sure. to you. Thank sure. you, Thanks. thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Ashok. And thank you, Akansh, uh, and thank you, Ashok, for joining us and providing the founder perspective on this. And thank what you. do you mean? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sriram. And uh, definitely a very insightful session, uh, you know, hearing from a, uh, you know, different lens point of view that, you know, how uh, from an operations perspective, what kind of complexities arise and, you know, very good example of, you know, how different stakeholders actually, you know, uh, intersect in terms of, you know, data handling and therefore, you know, what guardrails needs to be built up, you know, between different stakeholders. So I think that's, that's very, very important. Um, uh, you know, with this, uh, there are some questions that have come up in the Q&A chat box and uh, everybody, I mean, I would urge everybody to please feel free to add those questions as well. 
The first question is that is consent taking retrospective? Yes, it is under uh, section two, uh, six two. It is specifically provided that you know it can apply in case the consent is not taken for a specified purpose before it would be required to be taken. Uh, another question, uh, Goldie, if you can take up that question, is deemed consent acceptable? Uh, no, I think the the law has gone away with the concept of deemed consent. There is no, there is nothing called as deemed consent now. Consent has to be specific to the point for the purpose requested, so on and so forth. So deemed consent as a principle does not exist in the law now. Yeah. And maybe maybe for legitimate uh, users, probably, I mean, that could be an exception, but that's not yeah. really a deemed consent. It's not deemed consent per se. It's a, it's a different concept altogether. And the, the concept is for everything you need consent and except for legitimate uses, as, as, I, as I spoke about when I was sort of alluding to this. So whether it's for employee data, for medical emergency, for security of the state for a court purpose all of that is legitimate use and that is if it really want to somebody wants to use the word deemed consent then for legitimate legitimate uses it's a deemed consent you can you get one can understand that way but as a concept deemed consent does not exist in law sure thanks thanks Goldie. Uh, so Pratim, uh, one question to you uh, whether the act applies to the digital personal data only or data in a physical form also yeah, so uh, I think it makes it clear that uh, it applies to data in digital form, but you have to understand that if you scribble some personal data uh, which it, it, in, in a paper and then scan and put it into your computer, computer system or network, it comes within the fold of the law. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely right. And, uh, uh, you know, another question is, what is the recourse for the accidental disclosure of personal data? So you would want to place some light on that. Yeah, so I think, uh, see, uh, Goli was mentioning that there are certain penalties which are given, right? So number is up to 250 crore, which is equivalent to 30 million USD. But it's not that every incident goes there, right? If you see, there is there are certain thumb rules around certain parameters given, like repetitiveness of the breach, what was done to mitigate, what is the sensitivity of the data breach, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this will really take you there. Also for certain uh, sort of probably inconsequential kind of things. There could be an undertaking taken and the matter closed there. The intent you can clearly see is not to take every matter to the court, etc. So there are certain uh, new uh, good aspects which have been brought to play in this law. Hopefully these will come handy in certain accidental cases. But overall, I would say, see, demonstrating compliance is a very big thing. You can go wrong even after doing everything. Certain things can go wrong, right? But you can't say that I did nothing. Uh, I think that will be the thumb rule. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Uh, Shobit, one question to you. Uh, when client refuses to give consent for genuine transactions like KYC, what is the recourse? I mean, statutory requirement, but if the client says no, then what happens? <laughs> no, that obviously makes sense. So I think uh, it'll be a mix of a couple of things here. So one is where it is statutorily uh, required to be given. Um, that there, there should be a ground for processing that covers that. The other element is also, uh, you know, looking at from the from the data principle side of things, because the law seeks to sort of balance things out uh, in that sense. So there are a host of duties cast with on the data principle as well. So of course, it may not be to not give consent, um, but uh, you know, trying to withhold information or impersonating somebody else. So if they're trying to take any of those recourses. And even otherwise, um, you know, if they're trying to take an action which is vexatious in nature. So there are penalties that can be levied on the data principle also. So I think with that, the law definitely seeks, seeks to balance things out. Yeah, sure. No, no. Uh, that's definitely useful. Joyce, maybe a related question on this accidental disclosure of personal data. Um, any uh, any kind of uh, situations that you have witnessed as part of the cybersecurity uh, you know, advisors that you've given to clients and maybe uh, anything that, that probably you would like to, you know, comment on? So, um, in fact, uh, we, you know, in India, I would say the uh, enforcement of the DPDP, we'll have to see that, you know, how uh, the due course of how the proceedings will be handled. But I can share my experience. Uh, I do come from the industry as well of uh, having implemented GDPR and having responded to a data breach also uh, in Europe, um, I would say. Uh, there, it follows a line of investigation similar to what Shukrotim was trying to elaborate on, right? Uh, uh, so uh, if it, you know, in, in the event of a data breach and it gets into a line of investigation of you're saying that, 
uh, you know, what are the consequence, depending on what is the consequence and everything, the organizations will be evaluated on how did the accidental breach happen in the first place? Uh, were there enough, uh, you know, enough measures taken to prevent such an uh, accidental breach in the first place? And, uh, you know, it's the, the GDPR related investigations from the European Union is to go quite deeper into our, even looking at all the security controls from a network security standpoint, from an application security standpoint, a more holistic approach to ensure that the organizations did all they could, including re including reviewing practices like security awareness and trainings in organizations. That are you giving enough trainings to your people to avoid this kind of an accidental disclosure? Uh, if the accidental disclosure happened through your third party, the accountability on the judiciary to you know take that right measures so these these are the things looked at it and yes if you have done all this right the the impact on of you know the consequence or the penalties does get minimized significantly at least that was how it was implemented like, likely india will follow suit as well in you know along these lines in terms of you know how consequences are consequent management will be implemented here yeah no definitely an interesting one and uh, i'll take a liberty of asking one question to ashok as well uh, you know, since, uh, you know, you have been dealing with the BFSI sector and, uh, uh, you know, we do see that, you know, there there could be uh, and there have been, you know, cybersecurity outsourcing guidelines that have been issued by Reserve Bank of India. And we have seen that, you know, IRDA has come out with the similar regulations. IRD has come out with this. So, I mean, from your organization perspective, I mean, how are you aligning? Because, I mean, there will be an additionality that, you know, DPTP will bring in. So, um, yeah. Because you deal with multiple products, multiple legislations, which become applicable, not directly, but maybe, you know, as a service provider to a regulated entity. So, you know, yes. any any uh, feedback that you have there? So I think uh, uh, for us, um, the way we deal with it is one is anyway, there's uh, data localization norms, which uh, pretty much every regulator has. Uh, second part of it is there is um, there is. For certain regulators, they they do talk about um, um, you know um, uh, storing the data separately for them, like you know, like where so we do have single tenant instances which which are only for that particular customer or even maybe a, what you would call a cloud prem which is on their um, on their uh, data store. Uh, so that's taken care of, but in general. Um, because we don't keep the data for too long um, or we keep it in only in, uh, with a very specific you know uh, purpose and sometimes in our data world which which is only controlled by the by the end customer i don't we are pr pretty much compliant across uh, across these regulators um having said that i think uh, the regulation so so there are certain norms which will be different, right? Like for example, but I think that that's generally what the fiduciary takes care of is um, even though I, even though I might as a user and uh, data principal tell, tell an HDFC to delete my data, but uh, as far as RBI norms are concerned, they are supposed to keep that data for 10 years. Uh, so that'll, that'll usually supersede the uh, DPDP bill, right? Because that, and that's what they've, they've said as well. So, so those kind of things are taken care of by the fiduciary, not by us. Um, so I, yeah, we we don't hold the data for too long, to to fall under any of these uh, yeah, sure. nuances Thanks. of of the data. No, this is very useful. <clears throat> uh, I think just last question since you know Siddharth started the session, and I would want to conclude the session with Siddharth. So Siddharth, one question to you that you know uh, since now government is in the uh, phase of you know drafting the rules, and uh, you know uh, recently also uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar did a consultation, and he did speak that you know. We'll have some rules, you know, which will start coming out in a few days. And then, you know, he's given a six months timeline. So anything that, you know, um, as as an investor community and a, a startup community that, you know, probably, I mean, you would have, uh, you know, spoken about and therefore, you know, you expect that to be, you know, part of the rules. So maybe I, I just asked that question. I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer it. Right no, no, now. no worries. I think so rather than rather than specificity right now, because I think the investors here are so diverse all the way from real estate, infrastructure, technology, fintech, media social media as well, which I think is going to have one of the greatest knock-on consequences for that matter. I think one of the so one of the main things you've actually gone to industry to represent and to actually let them know is to say, look, even though the fines are fairly high, 250 crores, 500 crores for that matter, and you've actually seen sometimes, especially with the uh, GSC cases that are going on against the gaming, real money gaming companies as of now, sometimes to actually prove a point, they end up actually levying the highest fine that's actually available, that's actually available under law. 
So I think given the fact that these are on the highest onus of fines are there, there has to be commensurate to the data leak or the data issue that has actually occurred at that point in time. And it needs to take into account the relative size and paying power of that particular company itself. I think the one thing this actually does become a very, very crucial element that I believe is going to be common across all companies. Because look, let's face it, even larger organizations, government organizations, etc., have actually suffered data leaks in the past as well. Some of these are inadvertent, some of these are dirt. Easy to exploit. Some of these things are also out of out of scope, out of control for them as well. So what is supposed to be what is supposed to be flexibility given to the government? There should also be guardrails that actually come in, such that it doesn't become a case where they end up putting a large fine. You go into litigation and then you end up actually litigating it ad nauseum for that matter. I can go into various other details for this. We told them to adopt a consultation process. There needs to be specific carve outs and specific guidelines for specific industries as well. What applies to social media companies vastly different than what, what ends up actually applying, applying to a fintech company. I think the interplay with other regulations is something that actually needs stakeholder consultation also. But I think the fines is something that's going to be imperative and it's going to be a common thing across everyone. So if you ask me one thing, that would actually be the, uh, the comment that we've actually given that we hope they'll actually take into consideration also. That's, that's useful because, you know, that certainty is very, very important. And, you know, the country has been facing so much of a litigation burden and, you know, the cost of doing business becomes significantly high. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Pratham, why you, you know, you raised up your hand and, you know, happy to hear from you. But, uh, you know, a related question to you as well that, you know, uh, since we've also seen that, you know, the regulation also has devised a, a process with respect to, you know, the, uh, the, the appellate process and TDSAT has been nominated. So, I mean, how do you see this, you know, Will it go like a telecom way of, you know, dealing with TDSAT and then going to the Supreme Court or, you know, how do you see this happening, getting your perspective? I think that question I'd leave to show with his best place because he's a telecom lawyer as well. But let me uh, sort of tell you a little bit about this uh, consultation meet that happened uh, last Wednesday because I was fortunate to have been personally present there. What are the key takeaways from there? Okay, what was informed at least is that uh, in about thirty days the data protection board could be formed. In about thirty, which you can consider to be thirty to sixty, to my mind, realistically, um, rules would start getting rolled out between say thirty to forty-five days. Again, realistically, could be around say sixty days. You can consider. Uh, also, uh, there would be a staggering approach to rolling out of this law. Now, staggering in two manner. One, dependent on the kind of entity. For example, government entities, state bodies, etc., which are low on digitization, they could be given the maximum time. Then comes the second rung, which is basically early stage startups and MSMEs and maybe some hospitals, etc. And then comes the third, which is all other organizations, where the government expects that largely they should be compliant at the earliest. In case any organization wants any specific leeway for particular provisions of this law, they should make a, a representation at the earliest, either a entity or a kind of entity. They should be very specific on two things. One is what are those provisions against which they want exemptions or more time? What is the rationale for that? And again, I think it was very clear. Don't write uh, prose and poetry and theory around it. Be specific. And the third one is the exact time for which you want that extension. Okay. This is one category. The other staggering, which you could see, is in the context of the type of compliance that we're talking about. I think uh, handling of children's data and taking verifiable parental consent was one key aspect which was discussed, which will require engineering changes for many organizations. So we saw that the minister was pretty receptive to the idea that yes, for such things, probably more time would be required. Okay, You could also consider this for data subject requests because organizations will have to prepare for that, right? But notice and consent and things like those could probably go ahead first in the order. So that's the way probably we are looking at it. Um, and, and they are planning to roll it out this way. Uh, over to you, Shobhit, on the TD side question. Yeah, I, I think just, just one piece that I would like to add here is that, you know, apart from startups and, you know, uh, probably, I mean, giving some sort of a headway, there is also a talk about MSMEs, I mean, which is always yes, the favorite yes. topic of the government. Yes. So there also, I mean, they are looking for creating yes. some sort of a dispensation. Yeah, over to you, Shobhit. Right. But uh, yeah, so I, I think there are quite a few positives to take away from the law as far as the enforcement is also concerned. I think, uh, of course, TDSAT has had its own share of problems in the past and, you know, the time it takes. And as you mentioned, they are... Uh, the final, uh, you know, the Court of Appeal being the Supreme Court. So... Uh, but I think there are some positives. Like I said, there is a time-bound process that has been talked about in the law um, and both in terms of filing the appeal and the disposal of the appeal as well. 
So if it's really intended to be uh, followed in the truest sense, I think that that would be something to be uh, happy about. The other aspect is also there is um, the impetus on ADR. Uh, so the board can also refer parties to any alternate dispute uh, resolution mechanism like mediation and so on and so forth. So even those avenues would be available. Uh, so I, I think it'll be an interesting space to see as far as the enforcement goes. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I think time-bound uh, provisions will definitely should definitely help. Let's see how practically this gets implemented. While, you know, uh, we've seen other cases also like IBBI wherein, you know, there were time-bound uh, requirements, but, you know, from an implementation perspective, it took some time now. Probably, I mean, things are more streamlined. But yeah, I mean, uh, definitely it's a, it's, it's, it's a very welcoming move to that extent. Um, I think uh, I have not seen any other questions. If there is any any other question, probably I mean feel free to please. Uh, this the the floor is open. Over to you, Sri Ram. Otherwise, thank you. Yeah, I think a uh, good uh, good set of questions we had. I think uh, we're good to end this. But uh, before ending, I'd like to thank uh, Deloitte and Ketan uh, to actually partner with us and do this. I was quite needed uh, for. And from understanding from the investor and founder perspective and understand the broader perspective. Uh, I'd like to thank Siddharth uh, for opening and then Goldie for giving the presentation and then having an investor panel where Neha, thank you for moderating and taking charge on the panel and uh, Ashi, Shilpa, Supratim, thank you so much. Uh, Joyce, Ashok, Ak Akansh, Rahul, Shobit, thanks a lot for joining us. And also the attendees. I think we had a good turnout of attendees. And, and thank you. Thank you so much for staying for two hours with us and listening to us. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, we hope to do such kind of webinars on topical topics with our partners. Thank you so much, guys. Look forward. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.